Welcome to the WT FFF Special Series, brought to you by the Z and 3D print teams from HP, where your hosts, Tom and Tracy Hazard, explore the all about the what of 3D workflows from concept to print. Hey everyone, welcome to WTFFF. I'm Tom Hazard here with Tracy. And today we've got another great interview with someone from HP. And this time it's a subject area that's really close to home for Tracy in her experience from early in her career and actually really your whole career. You really yeah, have I, I, always made color material, finishes, textures. You're always the one at the back of the room like waving your hand and it's screaming, not good hey, enough <laughs> hey, you forgot about the texture you where's the color you know yeah, if you've listened to all of our episodes here you will see i probably mention it every single one at least once you oh yeah me no. yeah exactly <laughs> so no i know this is so this is the thing is like interestingly as we were sort of planning this series z by hp came into the into it as a co-sponsor you know even though they're within the same company but as a as a sort of co-sponsor of the series because i met them at adobe max so adobe max for those of you who have not heard of this it is like massive conference like it is gigantic i don't think i've been to a bigger conference that was so intensely packed that my brain hurt at the end of the day i mean it was like powerful inspirational talks and the, you know um billy eilish was there she was talking about her process um we just i mean there's just some really cool things that are going on at the event but then they have the the trade show floor and so you go on the trade show floor and you start to see some really cool fun things and one of the things that i saw was the whole sort of hp z by hp booth area and they were printing sunglasses and then they, they had this pyramid thing that was sitting next to a design computer and i was like i gotta find out what they're doing with this thing and it turns out that it was making scans and i mean saying scans because it's like way deeper than scans but making representations of of texture uh, from materials and i was like fascinated by it and i just had a great time i i had to go but i was like i, I didn't want to leave um and so we always said we were going to follow up and this is what the series actually sort of came out of it so i'm really excited to actually talk to someone in more detail about that so we've got josh st john joshua st john from the head of creators from z by hp and he heads up the project captus which is what we're going to talk a bit about today he's p passionate creative technologies and he has a background in design and digital manufacturing his work and he has appeared on cnn and gadget cnet sci-fi the verge animal planet and more he's a recovering new yorker but he's based in encinitas and he has lived and traveled across the globe um, in Brazil, Hong Kong, India, and the UK, where he's had some notable stints. He's an avid photographer, a 3D designer, and a creator who's only build, always building something in his studio. And I think it shows in his passion for what he's talking about today. So I'm super glad that we get to talk to Josh today. So Josh St. John. Josh, thanks so much for joining us today. I'm excited to talk about hey, my favorite here. subject, color, pattern, texture, like the whole thing, the materials, right? That's my side of it. Great to be here. I'm excited to uh, air the project and uh, uh, talk to you guys. Yeah, this is really a treat for Tracy because rarely in 3D design, at least in our experience and in anything 3D printing related, does color, pattern, and texture really get a lot of focus and attention. So this is a treat. <laughs> That's right. Tracy. We tend to talk a lot of form and function and how the printers work. And we don't get to talk about those surface details, which I have a degree in. So this is something that we love. What I'm so excited about though, is that sort of this, like, how did this come about that you said this is important? that this is worth concentrating on because it's not the most common thing for a lot of engineers and designers to be thinking about the surface end. I, I mean, the, the, that's a hard question because there's a lot of different places I can start. But I, I, think, I think where I'll start is um, over the last, I don't know, 50 years, you know, a lot of the made world has shifted to digital. So, uh, and if you look at the sets of CAD CAM tools, they kind of grew up alongside of the you know, the machines, uh, so the representations of the CAD systems, all of that is kind of mirrored with the machine. Um, and I know that, that stuff stretches actually back longer than that, but I'm, I'm generalizing. But so shape and form is really digitized today, but materials are not. Materials are still completely analog. 
if you look at uh, the textile industry as just one example, you know, how do you look at your part, uh, you know, your samples, you get, you know, swatches of material and these books and it's still very analog. And it's because, um, well, there's a lot of different reasons, but uh, I've just been obsessed with materials like my whole adult life and even before that. So this project really sprung out of uh, a hybrid of just general interest in 3D and fabrication techniques and the, the need to see material workflows go digital. Well, you know, this is, you and I must be like separated at birth. I don't know, because this is like my fascination with everything has always been this. Um, but it, it's really, uh, I, I felt it was early on that there was so much of the industry that was focused on how to create the CAD models, how to create the files, right? How to do all of the geometry, how to get those things right, accurate, how to start getting them to be predictive and all those other things. And to them, they weren't trained to have material like it was always uh, the early industrial design model of teaching was model it in gray, add color later, right? <laughs> you know, add material later. So it wasn't even a part of their thought process and their own design process. But for me, that comes first. And for you, it sounds like it does as well. Yeah, it's a hybrid. I mean, I started like, I, get, I just, it's funny this morning I was, uh, we did a product line, told the story about getting my first CNC machine and it was 1995 at a public high school in New England. And uh, I was a freshman and, and, and learning how to cut, you know. Ever since that moment, just being obsessed with like being able to make things physically. And I ended up becoming a jeweler. Uh, and that's when I got my first 3D printer was like, in the early 2000s, it was uh, uh, like an early SolidScape machine, um, SolidScape. You know, I learned so much about the, the, the way that I learned so much about user experience from the jewelry industry. Nobody really gets that. It's like uh, if you if you put all the finest materials into something, the finest craftsmanship, and like I spend all this time on it, and then I give it to somebody, and they go, eh. And then you know they show me something that is like made out of a horribly tarnished silver. You know, it's an impure alloy. It has a synthetic stone in it from like the early 1900s their grandfather or something bought it when they were deployed overseas. I mean, this story happened to me countless times. And I would, at first I'd tell them, I'm like, oh, you're stone synthetic, the metal's no good, da 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 And they would look like I was insulting them. And I'm like, I'm just telling you the truth. This is the truth. And what I realized is that like, there is this connection that people make with physical things that's not informed by logic. And the, the materials, the patina of the materials are, uh, almost influenced by our own like love of that thing. So coming up through the 3D printing industry over you know the last decade, decade and a half, you know, materials have been an afterthought because it was like, what can we print? You know, where can we go? But now we we have a wider range for on the 3D printing side and on the realization side it's immense to really express materials in all of their you know, complexity. I don't know. That's a little bit maybe <laughs> rambling, but. Uh. No, 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 no. It was just bringing to mind this, uh, this necklace that I had gotten. My mom, my mom was diagnosed with breast cancer on 9-11 and as part of the, the hospital, they had given um, everyone the, the, as a charity thing, these heart necklaces where they had a, like a thumbprint in it. And, um, and so it was like, you were, you know, you would receive it and it was a pendant. And I can remember like she would be in getting treatment and I'd be in the lobby and I would just be rubbing it because it was perfectly fit for your thumb and I would be rubbing it. And it ended up with this beautiful color, which I knew the material was not good, but it ended up with this cool finished color. And I must've spent hours trying to figure out how to replicate it on a product that I wanted to make. And there just, it just wasn't easy, right? So I get that, I understand that, that we have this connection to color pattern and texture that is on a, a level that we don't understand. It touches us straight in the heart, you know, and, and we just don't, we don't um, really see it um, consciously. We don't understand it consciously. Yeah, you, you bring up gray models in CAD and uh, you look at like a cube or the edge of something and it's so perfect. That doesn't exist anywhere. You know, like everything is cracked and broken and wrinkled and dusty, like everything. So being able to get to that level with our digital representations is just really important to me. I just think that it puts humanity, it puts like our experience into into those uh, the, those digital assets. Well, let, let's get a little bit of background here so that everybody catches up here. So tell us a little bit about what Z by HP is because that's kind of new to us here. Um, we haven't really heard that part. And then we'll talk about Project Captus. 
Yeah, sure. So uh, Z, uh, Z by HP is a, is a, in some ways it's a new brand because we launched it two years ago at uh, um, Adobe Max. Um, but actually, uh, it might be three or three Adobe Maxes ago. You know. But actually, Z workstations have a long history. So um, the workstations division of HP, we create uh, the, the high performance machines for mission critical tasks. And this extends from things like oil and gas, aerospace, media and entertainment, product development, and now extending into areas like AR, uh, XR, uh, VR, all of, uh, all, all of the R's you know, for the immersive experience. All of the art. <laughs> I know, I love I that. Like, we, like XR, it covers it all, right? <laughs> Original reality. Yeah, so it's our, it's our brand of workstations. Uh, um, we make, uh, we have a line of desktops and uh, mobiles, as well as some centralized solutions uh, that we sell to people all over the world, to creators all over the world who are uh, you know, making all of the things that uh, we interact with. And so how did, and Project Captus came out of that, right? Yeah, Project Captus is a little bit of a, so I came into HP to join a group called Immersive Computing. And um, as a part of that, uh, that's where Sprout came from. I don't know if you guys are familiar with the Sprout project. It was really uh, innovative. And uh, I came in after Sprout um, and we were really looking at 3D scanning. And that's where Project Captus really started was when we were, um, we acquired a company called David Laser and they made a structured light 3D scanner. And uh, we were partnered with Adobe and uh, we have some really great uh, friends and you know, collaborators over there. And they had um, you know, some ideas about how to make digit, uh, material digitizers. And uh, that, that was the beginning. And when I joined uh, Z by HP about two years ago, Project Captus kind of came, came with me. You know, it's so I got to see it at the big announcement that was at Adobe Max, um, and so that's where I, I where I actually saw it, and I got to they demoed the, the the little pyramid for me. It was really cool, um, and so and and we were looking at that, and and I was talking to uh, the technician who was running it, whose name I wish I remembered. I wish he had Daniel a card. Or Dylan. It was Daniel or Dylan. If he had long hair, it was Dylan. No, nope. he had short hair, so it must be Daniel. There you go. <laughs> and so he was demoing it, and we were talking about the complexities of patterns and textures and lighting, and and he was like, he was like, you're very unusual here. And I was like, well, I have a huge textile design experience, so I know what you're trying to scan, how why it's so hard. And so we hadn't seen anything, but I, I have to tell you, it's like it was fast. And I looked at that, and I thought, wow, I can remember spending tens hundreds of hours trying to clean up scans just to make simulations in the early part of my textile design career. Oh, awesome. And they never looked anywhere as good as that did in what was, I don't know, I think I spent 10 minutes standing there. Yeah, I mean, physically based rendering, which is the technique that we're using, it's, it's not new. I mean, it's been around for a while, but it's really like emerged as the standard for rendering. And uh, we call it PBR. I like to say PBR is the new RGB. Uh, <laughs> I like that. Well, it's because you get to paint in shadow and you get to paint, you know, so like um, you get to paint without shadow and then add shadow in afterwards. So that, that's really the, the beauty of physically based rendering. So um, once you have the materials, the way you can visualize them is so compelling. And there's so much standardization coming across the, uh, the rendering engines today and the GPUs have gotten so good that it's just unbelievable the quality of uh, uh, visual fidelity that you can get and uh you know captus for the for the vast majority of especially textiles it's uh very fast it's uh and th there's nothing quite 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 like it on, on, on the market today you know tom you didn't get to see it so maybe no, you should have josh tell us a little bit about there. how it works and how how it, how it, how it happens yeah and what's because the... we were talking about the difference of the type of technology that they're using so it's not you know, when we well, yeah, so, so, you know, we actually have studied, you know, 3D imaging, scanning, uh, and, and a lot of times more to create a three-dimensional object from a series of photos, which I think is called photogrammetry, but you've got a different process with a, a little bit similar name called photometry. Can you help explain the, the difference? Yeah, for sure. So, um, photogrammetry is uh, aimed at creating uh, geometry. Uh, so it, it works on the premise that if you have two images of the same object, if you can determine the distance between the pixels, then you can, and you, and you know that distance, then you can determine the depth. And they use a lot of uh, pictures and, um, you know, they can kind of boost their way in there. There's, there's other techniques like 
where you can project on top of it, like is inside of your phones today or the connect sensor where you're projecting either visible or invisible light to help match those pixels. That would be uh, active uh, 3D scanning or um, versus uh, more of a passive uh, uh, photogrammetry technique. With um, all of these require lots of Im uh, images and um, for, for this kind of, uh, it's called the correspondency problem. So figuring out which pixel is which on the object. And from that, you determine the depth and you end up with point cloud. And from the point cloud, you can do all kinds of cool stuff like meshing and you know, reverse engineering and stuff. So that's photogrammetry. Photometry, you're looking at shadows. Uh, st stereo photometry, there's, there's, there's a number of different approaches, but in this case, we're not changing the location of the sensor. What we're doing is we're changing the way we cast light onto the object. So if I shine, um, um, I'll, I'll provide you with a, with a GIF that maybe you can include to explain. Oh yeah, so there's great. always a blog post for this episode at 3dstartpoint.com, everyone. So as you're listening to this, it, there's gonna be a, a GIF or a GIF, depending on which you, <laughs> what, what school you subscribe to on that one. And, uh, but we'll have that for you so you can see it in, in action. Yeah, um, and, and what, what we're able to do is shine the light from eight different um, um, light sources and watch the way the shadows uh, uh, move. The other thing that we do is, is we, 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 use a, we have a polarizing filter. So we uh, take uh, cross-polarized and, uh, and co-polarized uh, images, and we can compare those as well so that um, shiny areas can be masked out, and we can know that they were shiny and not shiny. And, and then we can also take a, a, if you want to get a transparency layer, you can actually put the sample onto a piece of plexiglass and shine light from beneath and that's watch the light. fantastic. Like we don't wow. get, then that's, you know, the opacity of a material has a lot to do with its perception and how it looks. And when you can't render that properly, you, you're not demoing what it looks like. We had that problem. We used to design a lot of chairs. We designed a lot of chairs in our career. And um, in fact, kind of like the one you're, you're, you're virtually sitting next to, you see how you, you need to sign yeah. light through yeah. it. Yeah, that chair right there, right? You know, you have a material that actually has spaces between it, like a mesh trying to simulate the air coming through it without making it like visually distracting and like you know just get the sense of air and space between it that it's not solid there that's hard to do yeah and if you needed to represent it as geometry it would be so heavy you wouldn't be able to oh, so i've tried, believe me, that's, we another, tried. Believe me. that's very <laughs> tricky yeah that's another really nice thing about these pbr techniques is that i can use really you know, i'll go back to photogrammetry photogrammetry I love 3D scanning. I've been 3D scanning for like, I got my first 3D printer in 04, I think. And I got my first first 3D printer in 04. Got my first 3D scanner, I think, in 06. The 3D scan data is just so hard to use. It is just, there's not a good tool to this day wow. that, I, that I love using. I, I, there is one tool that I use, but it's like, kind of an obscure one, but uh, <laughs> the geometry is um, so painful. But when you have a good, good object with right texture maps, you, you can use it in so many different ways. I mean, uh, it's, it's um, much more flexible than yeah, having Yeah, I think creating, for instance, the back of a chair that like in the video just to your left that, you know, it creating that as a single plane object and then yeah. mapping the texture of the mesh on it is much less CPU and RAM intensive with a computer and yeah, still produces the result you want, right? There's cool techniques for it now. I mean, a simple example is if I just take a, a displacement map, like just a grayscale map, let's say 4K by K, pixel into a point, X, Y, Z. And I compare the file size of the point cloud that I created to that 4K image. I mean, it's it, there's a there's a type of compression that's happening that's happening there. Um, but it's still hard to use. The workflow is all stuck. I mean, it's really really uh, really difficult. So uh, you know, Project Cap is we're aimed at fixing that, like making it easier to uh, be able to have that physicality uh, without the complexity. There's some challenges there that aren't really in, involved in Project Captus and it has to do with CAD models versus CG models and topology, um, but 
Well, and that's why you're working with partners like Adobe and other people. So you, you have some mind yeah. share on that stuff. You know, one of the things that I was talking with Daniel about when I was at the Adobe Mac show and really getting into some, you know, they were printing out um, sunglasses, which I'll share a picture of, of the one that I have, um, because the, they were not only the, they were beautifully printed packages that went with it, but you probably got a pair <laughs> lying around. Yeah, exactly. Those ones. And so, but texture for us in production hides a whole matter of sin. Like, I mean, in the producing oh, yeah. process, right? But it can in 3D print as well, because there's a uh, there's this uh, quality perception that goes along with being with seeing, you know, lines and, you know, just or the way that consumers just, perceive Just it. the powder texture that naturally comes on certain Ooh. objects. And to textures can really disguise those things and take your eye away from the limitations of the material and read it more as a fine object. Yeah, I mean, kind of going back to the, um, the, the design systems that came up with like subtractive, they like were built for each other. Like imagine if you could design like, like one grain of sand at a time, like it doesn't exist. There's no system for that. There's no approach. So I think the things that are looked at as uh, problems with 3D printing surfaces or whatever is are actually just opportunities that haven't been kind of uh, uncovered yet. Like MJF, multi-jet fusion from HP, I mean, the, the, the arrays, the print arrays that we take from our page-wide printing technology, texture is a superpower. Like we, like when I show people the quality of um, faux textile stitching, et cetera, like people will look at it and be like, not even know what it is. And um, yeah, I, I think it's really that the design systems just aren't matched to the, like people have tried to take mechanical CAD and apply it to uh, additive approaches. And uh, it's gonna take 50 years before the design systems are there. Not just the, the, the user interface, but the actual underlying replications, the, the way in which the computer can understand those complexities has to be managed in some way. So. Yeah, I, uh, 3D printing and textures. Project Captus is 90% about visualization, but for me, it's like 99% about 3D printing or additive <laughs> manufacturing. Well, yeah, because to me, this is, you know, when we first started the show way back when, this was the holdback. They were the not being able to have good color, not being able to have good texture. There was, it was always going to have this, uh, is it real? Is it fake? Is it going to hold up? Like the consumer doesn't have an educated, isn't willing to make the educated leap at any point. They want what they want and they want to look the way that they want. And color pattern and texture is a huge part of that. So resolving one of those factors with everything that you're doing, that's huge right there. Yeah. Like Tom, that's a, a beautiful shirt that you're wearing. Okay. Thank you. Was it made on a Singer 5000 sewing machine? <laughs> Nobody no cares. No idea. I don't care. <laughs> no one cares. That's right. Like, like there's a few of us geeks who are like, my sunglasses are 3D printed. But for the yeah. most part, that's not how people shop. They that's don't go right. out and say, yeah. So you have to meet them where they are. And the thing about additive and the textures today is we can do things that aren't possible any other way. That is always what's excited me about 3D printing is doing things that couldn't be made any other way, not just making something a different way, because that, that to me is the excitement. And then the, the textures, the, the visualization of it. And like you were saying about my shirt, it's all about making that emotional connection with whoever the consumer is. Right. And they're complex, right? So as we're all sitting here in our is under quarantine um you know one of the things that i think that's awesome about 3d printing right now is the way people are mobilizing around the world and uh, that's the other thing it's not it can only be made with 3d printing but like speed time to market distributed supply chain all of those other things that we're seeing the value of right now like having all of this infrastructure split, spread around the globe that instantly can turn because it's much harder to change a um you know, a, a manufacturing site that's, you know, built for one specific thing than it is to start printing different geometries in the material. So 3D printing offers a, a flexibility that I think we're seeing another vector of its um, utility beyond can only be made that way. Like right, right, right now. I mean, in three months time, we'll see that the masks made out of, you know, non-woven blown materials, they'll be enough. But in the, in, the, in the meantime, there's all of this amazing work that's going on that is, 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 is I mean, it's beautiful. It's, it's really- It's inspirational, yeah. You know, and this is the thing is that, is that 
people, what I love most about 3D printing is that all of a sudden it gets personalized. So even if someone's taken a, you know, that the, the, there was a, the bands that help hold the mask on the back of your head that, yeah. you know, it relieves the pressure off the ears, which definitely is necessary if you've worn a mask out in public at all. Um, but that um, I've seen somewhere there, they've definitely customized it. And I looked at it and I thought, I bet you anything. And then if sure enough, you, it, there's got to be some hair problem. Like it was catching in their hair and they changed the design of it just slightly so that it wouldn't yeah. catch in their hair anymore right and so I was like I was like I love that how that just those little bits of flex that's where we start to get it and we do get that so much in pattern and texture like that's where a lot of personalization happens to people because they do make it something that they love they appreciate they they embed their personality into their objects that way yeah and, and textures in the content like digital materials in the context of COVID too I mean like uh, a lot of supply like China's supply chain is turning back on right now because um it's just starting to kind of ramp back up. Um, but while it was down, you know, uh, um, so many materials are just made in China today. Uh, the, the textile mills, the tanneries, they're, they're all there. So, um, you know, having a, a digitized process is, uh, you know, the, the, you know, like kind of thinking about the remote work thing, remote work used to be thought of as like a luxury, but now I think there's the shift of, actually know it's we have to have that capability as a backup for the economy because if we do need to put in something like social distancing you know the economy can't miss a beat so we need to be able to ship so having those um systems in place to be able to manage that um you know digitization of materials related to anything in garment or um uh, i mean pretty much any industry really uh, there, there has to be that kind of digital uh, I guess it's kind of a hype buzzword now, the digital twin of all of these, uh, all of these materials. Oh, I so, I so agree. <laughs> you, you know, I've been begging for that integration process, but I think one of the challenges that I think you're probably facing and part of why I think you probably have looked at doing the collaborations with different parts of divisions and, and with Adobe and, and in, in general is that a lot of it also has to happen on an education side from the creative side. The creative designers need to be educated on the use of materials and the properties of materials and things like that. Yeah. Which they don't, always get today yeah i mean I, I think it's also the same with like design for additive i mean you, um, you you talk to mechanical engineers who came up through that that world like th th they have to learn new tool sets you know like the the, the, the these are generational changes you know i i think of how lucky i was to get exposed to technology so early but now the kids coming out of school like they they, they you know they, they you know they were high schoolers or whatever during the maker movement you know they were you know they got their they, their first robotics competition, you know, in, in junior high school, all of that stuff, they come up with thinking kind of volumetically and thinking in a different way. And uh, yeah, I think the same thing needs to happen for the materials. People have to understand the way light interacts with surfaces and changes it. I mean, if you look at things that are um, uh, like highly anisotropic, like uh, fancy woods like you know like rich oh, wood. <laughs> simulating wood tom and i have done a lot of furniture over our years so we've simulated a, we well we not only that but sometimes we'd have to design uh faux veneers right like so you're yeah. you're, you're when we used to joke it was like pictures of wood on pictures of wood right and so that's how bad it was but they were never we could never quite get the full texture and the, the full look we wanted in our heads it would not it's not achievable yeah it's quantum i mean it's literally quantum like it's yeah. uh the way in which the light hits it from one angle is completely different than the way it hits it from the, the other level. And um, we do have, uh, like with physically based rendering, we have pretty good techniques for doing a lot of this stuff now. Um, you know, I'll show you, um, you know, some wood scans that, uh, that the team's been able to achieve and they're, yes, super compelling. Yeah, I'd love to see that and maybe <laughs> put a photo of that in the blog post as well. That'd be yeah. great. I mean, so tell us what stage everything's at right now. So this is probably going to air in a couple months, you know, within a month and to month to two months. So, but what, it, what, what's really going on with, um, with the Z project and with, you know, and, and the project captus in general, like where are things that can, can we buy it yet? You know? Yeah. So, so uh, what we announced at Adobe max was, um, uh, a set of partnerships. Uh, so we, we've engaged with a uh, handful of customers. We, the COVID thing is, probably going to slow down our announcement plans. It, we're not really sure when, um, you know, events are going to kind of fire back up, etc. So, uh, you know, stay tuned for announcements in the fall, but we are engaged with a set of customers across industries, getting their feedback and uh, kind of response. And 
know, really what we're trying to do is understand the workflows better, understand uh, where the pain points are, you know, the difference in needs between a game designer or a furniture maker or an automotive person or an architect. Well, these are different. Uh, fashion designer. Uh, they're very different and the, the device could be different. Um, so we're, we're very focused on really just understanding that user need and those kind of user modes. And then on the technology side, you know, um, how do we make it like super accessible and usable? So, uh, you know, the team at Adobe, uh, I, I want to specifically call out my two partners in this. There's uh, uh, Anthony Salvi, um, principal product manager at Adobe now, came from a company called Algorithmic that they acquired uh, earlier this year, and a guy named Jerome Durrell um, that are both uh, uh, just instrumental. It, the, actually, the design of the device came, came from them, the initial concept and design came from them um so yeah by the way the device that i saw was 3d printed by the way and yes. because they were testing it right they were they were it was you know basically all of them are, all of them yeah are and i thought i thought great like you know use your use your use your skill set to do what you need to do in your own work process i thought it was really great yeah and the funny story is so they they supplied me the the kind of concepts and we had our agreement and um I, my son was born and uh, I was on paternity leave and uh, I designed this lamp for him that was like all snapped together, node structure that would go into one MJF build. And I thought about it and I was like, huh, I can use the same act approach to build the, the scan box that we called it at the time, uh, what became Project Captus. And uh, so, so I did. And the initial idea was we were going to wrap it all in textile. And uh, the guys in the model shop that I, you know, the, at HP that, that I work with, Brian is his name. Uh, he doesn't know how to sew. So um, he was like really like troubled, like how are we gonna get this thing cut and sewn? We don't know how to do pattern making, like it's gonna have to get a contractor, it's gonna be a pain. So I was like, let's 3D print textile onto the surfaces. So I scanned the material that I wanted it. Uh, 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 well, I took a displacement map that, uh, I actually didn't scan the material. I took a displacement map that matched the material that we wanted to use. And I displaced the geometry in 3D printing that way, even added little stitching in. So uh, yeah, all of the devices today are completely, all of the non-electronic and non-mechanical components are all 3D printed uh, today for, for all of the Project Captus devices. <laughs> wow. I love it, well, all completely meta, I love certain, that. <laughs> certain certain um, uh, uh, integrity and honesty in that. Yeah, that's right, that's right. So. What do you think, uh, you know, from the role at what's going on at, at Z by HP and, and the things, projects that you're all involved in, like, what do you think is the challenges going forward for the 3D print industry, for the digital manufacturing, for the creative side of processing, whatever side you want to tackle in this answering this question, but what do you see as some of the challenges going forward that, that you know, uh, maybe are outside of the realm of control, it's sort of an, an industry challenge? Yeah, I mean, there's a few pieces. If I just put on my Z by HP hat on, you know, like right now because of COVID, you know, everybody's shifting to remote. So like uh, we, um, you know, had to support all of our customers and how do they shift their workforce forces remote. Um, so, so that's been a big, you know, kind of uh, pending topic. And it's, it's, it's been pretty amazing to see how fast we, we could do that. On the Project Captus side, you know, in the context of um, everything that's going on, how, how do we uh, engage with these customers who are now all remote? That, that's been, that's been uh, a challenge we had to, uh, you know. You have a kind of slow down in the processing and because and, they have a lot of their other side of the business they have to figure out. Right, yeah, you know, when you talk about innovation projects, it's like innovation projects. Right now, right now is the time for, uh, uh, um, right now is the time for like kind of dedicated and focused edu uh, execution and, um, I will say though, because everybody really understands the need for this long term, that we've been able to find find, find the way. So in the short term, we want to keep the um, the testing going, keep the software evolving, um, iterate more on the hardware, and really understand this customer pain points. The um, what what we're about is like workflow, <laughs> like what are those workflow experiences that make things not. Awful. You know, like <laughs> I we spend a lot of time interviewing creators and you hear how much part of their time is spent dealing with the kind of overhead of the workflow and not being in that creative zone. And like we Tom and I are looking at each other because like this is this is really what we struggle with as designers that 
so much of our time, which means the money because we are, you know, we bill hours or we bill by projects, right? It's spent in this workflow things or trying to get things to be better, visualized better, just so we can communicate what we need. But reality is, is it's not a creative part of the process. It's not the innovative part. It's not the part they want to pay you for. That's not the part they want to pay you for, right? It's like that saying like, uh, oh, it only took you five seconds to draw, but it took me 30 years to learn how to draw in five seconds. But the, 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 the thing I, I wanted to, to touch on is, um, I don't know about you, but when I finish a project, I kind of like, I don't know, it's, I'm never like happy. That's not the feel, like, I'm never like, oh, it's awesome. Like, the part that I really enjoy is when I'm in it. Like, that creative zone, that collaboration, those arguments and fights and micro wins and, you know, just losses and setbacks and self-doubt all of that stuff is the part that's enjoyable when the outcome is done you're like it's a relief and maybe you're proud of the work maybe the work stands the test of time maybe it's useful to somebody in some way but it's like transit it, like it's yeah, you're on to the next sweet. thing already right <laughs> exactly especially when um when you release products because by the time the product actually hits the market like i'm already halfway through the next cycle so yeah. that seems like the old the old work. So I, I think we're really just focused on how do you make that process awesome? Like, how do you, how do you really like learn from the process? And in the macro trend, I think that I've been watching a slow motion collision between CG and visual effects and digital fabrication and mechanical engineering my whole career. Like the representations of CAD, B-Rep, blah, 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 nerve surfaces versus poly models and topology and texture maps. These things were like oil and water. You can't, can't mix them. And then, you know, you throw into additive where you have volume and now you're talking about like, I don't know, CT machines and like DICOM stacks. Like how do you deal with the volume? So I feel like there's just underlying kind of representation problems that we just haven't sorted through to fully take advantage of what mechanical systems can can do today. So, you know, I guess on the workflow side, just really trying to focus on process and improve those experiences. And on the technology side, trying to mitigate or innovate around some of the underlying technical challenges. Mm. I think those are really important. And you know what I love there is like, you're not in the weeds of, oh yeah, we're still trying to solve how we get light onto this. And you know, no, we're worrying about how we're going to help everyone use it. That I think is really where, what has been eye-opening for me as we've been talking to everyone from HP over the, over the course of the series, just uh, planning the series and other things is that the types of areas you all are focused on is just so fantastically helpful to us as users and designers and business owners and all of those things. So we appreciate all your hard work. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, it, I said again and this morning, I was just talking about, I mean, HP is literally a company founded by creators in a garage, Bill and Dave. It was the original garage, right? It was like, and they, they had like, um, you know, insubordination was just a part of the culture. And actually one thing to kind of point out about Project Captus is it wasn't insubordination, but like, it was always like a set of side projects of some curious and passionate, you know, engineers finding cycles to innovate on it. And uh, HP definitely makes room for that. It's an incredible, incredible company. And I'm I, I, uh, really proud to be a part of it. Well, Josh, thank you so much for coming on the show today. Everyone, you know that there'll be a, a blog post for it. So we'll definitely insert all of those great resources that he referred to here today. So thanks for joining us. Yeah, thanks so much. Stay safe, guys. You know, Tracy, I was really impressed to learn that Josh really gets into all different aspects of what he does with the work, that he actually created models and was, you know, testing things out. And even during his paternity leave, he mentioned, right, that he was creating a a 3D printed lamp and then was inspired and realized, hey, the project kept this device that's going to scan all these things, we can model that and to be way. printed on our printer and 3d print it it, it just makes total sense so it, you know it's interesting that it takes somebody with this sort of 
multidisciplinary talent and education to be able to drive a project like this forward? Well, and I think so often that's what we get into is that so many of uh, of the companies and the people we talk about because they have limited budgets, so they're they're some uh, they they get into their technology realm and they stay right within that and it what they don't realize is all these other things still have to ca have to come in around you. Collaborations are required. You need to partner up with companies. Mm -hmm. You need to work on workflow. You have to have a, you know, as one of our good friends, Betsy Westhaver calls it, you got to have a customer advisory board. You've got to be able to talk to these customers. You got to build a dialogue back and forth between them. So, you know, that's what they're really building and doing because they see that bigger picture of how things are going on. So that's, I'm really impressed by this, but you know, what I think back in is that what we really also have to recognize as designers in this environment or as creators, makers, what, wherever you are in it, production, you know, if you're even on the digital manufacturing side of things, there is not going to be the consumer acceptance of things, the consumer perception of things, the bar has gotten really raised in every single area. You know, when he was talking about all the XR, the VR, the AR, the, all of these things, right? But our, our television, our movies, all of these things have gotten like amped up there in terms of production quality. And you can't just rely on having the biggest budget and being able to have uh, the best creative team on the planet to be able to, you know, do the, you know, <laughs> you know, do the next fantastic Netflix series or whatever it's going to be coming out of it, right? You've got to be able to equalize that so that everyone can have access to it because otherwise there's going to be such a gap between what consumers will accept. Well, that's the thing. And the consumer doesn't care how it's made. You know, they really don't. They just want the end result product there. You, you've got to create something people want. And I thought it was a great point Josh made about, you know, does anybody care? I think he called it the Singer 5000. I would have called it the Binford 6100. <laughs> but anyway. Now we're know, really dating ourselves, right? But still, <laughs> you, you, nobody cares how it was made. They only care about, is it desirable? Do they, you know, is there a need for it? Do they want it? And at the end of the day, am I going to create a personal connection? To right. It, right. So, you know, I mean, this is the thing. Look, I'm just going to go back because this is one of our last episodes that we did prior to the series, but we did an episode on this 3D print mic flag that is, you can see it in the video. We'll drop a photo of it into the blog post and it's 3D printed. Do, does anybody care that it's 3D printed? No, but because we 3D printed it, we were able to create this slot of which we could easily drop in the um, customized show logos. Our clients on our podcasting business side love it. Absolutely. They have a, this is their thing. They're, they they don't care how it was made. It was just the fact nope. that we were able to make it that way in order to be able to deliver them something that created that personal connection for them. That's what they care about at the end of the day. And that's our ultimate goal is if we can make ease that all up for everybody and just make that so that we become personally connected to the stories in our videos, the game that we're playing, the movie that we're watching and the objects that we, we buy and consume. That's fantastic, right? Absolutely. And, you know, while I actually had some apprehension that when people get this mic flag, they're going to notice it's 3D printed, that it has the layer lines in it. I got to tell you, out of hundreds and hundreds of them that we have provided to our clients or shipped to people, and I have people that keep coming back and we give them away to customers at a certain level, but we also have people coming and buying them from us. Not one customer has ever asked me is that 3d printed or how is that made or why are why is this texture person. on it you did because I, I haven't one had one person any. i had them on display at a trade show and they go ah. and they like picked it up and they're like is this 3d printed like and they were fascinated by it but i have had it where i tell them that it was 3d printed after the fact and that makes it even cooler to them right so but it starts from the fact that the whole thing is textured everything is right and everything is right from the beginning and this is something that I learned really early on because I came out of that textile world and I, and we did significant research back when I worked for Herman Miller on how color pattern and texture affects productivity and acceptance with the users and consumers and people in an, and specifically in that case, it was in, in an environment, right? Um, not just with an object. But at the end of the day, that's what people respond to first when they say they don't like something it's typically a response to the color, the pattern, and the texture mm. of it first. Then it's function and form right after that. 
but the gut reaction and not liking something is a is a, a tactical a tactile and visual thing or the gut reaction that piques your interest and your curiosity to go and look a little closer and say what is that i i want to understand what that is is again also one of those initial physical qualities right and it, it's so much more important today because think about how much digital shopping we're doing think about how much digital searching we're doing right so if our digital images of things if our digital uh, production of things is not at a caliber at which we're capturing attention we're getting lost so kudos to the, the HP team, kudos to Z by HP and the Project Captus and everything that they're doing over there because I'm excited about this to come to market because I really think it's gonna change not just the workflows and the, the quality of everything that comes out, but I also think it's gonna change the design process for so many to be able to do things that they thought, oh, this is just too hard so I'm not gonna address it, but now they will be able to. And so our design process yeah. will become more holistic. Uh, yeah, hopefully considered earlier in the process too. Yeah. Awesome. So I love that. Well, as you all know, you can get all of the information, the photos, the, all the different things that we referred to in the episode will be at the blog post for 3dstartpoint.com um, for this episode. And then also, we also have all the tools and all the different resources and links to everything at 3dstartpoint.com forward slash HP. So check it out and don't forget to come back again. Yeah, because there's more. There's lots more we'll to come. Back. So thanks so much for listening. I'm Tracy Hazard. On WTFFF. <laughs> do you want to say Tom Hazard? Yeah, okay. Cut the video and do this part again. Right, do it again. So thanks everyone for listening. I'm Tracy Hazard. With Tom Hazard here on WTFFF. Thanks for listening to the WTFFF special series brought to you by the Z and 3D print teams from HP. You can access all the resources mentioned in this episode and all the other episodes in this series by going to 3dstartpoint.com slash HP. We invite you to reach out to us on social at 3 dstartpoint and at Z by HP and let us know what you are creating in 3D.